I V M. There have been moments where I have come home from a, a long days of work and just broken down in front of my wife because I didn't know how we were going to be able to pull through because we didn't have the licenses, we had the salaries to pay, we had rents to pay, we had at least like a, a crore worth of you know machinery that we had purchased. We had equivalent amounts in raw material that was tied up and sitting in a cold storage in close to Bombay and near the port. There are still moments of doubt in terms of how we are going to scale the business, where are we going to get the funding from, uh, what is our strategy going to be. Um, you know, one of the things that I have learned is I think nothing kind of trains you for the mental and emotional roller coaster of setting up a business other than just having to do it. Hello and welcome to the Filter Coffee Podcast. When we talk about the Indian alcohol market, I think it is safe to say that the past decade was largely the decade of wine. Even though in the last three to four years, we had a flurry of entrants in the craft beer and even the meals category. India is probably going through a very vibrant phase when it comes to entrepreneurship in the homemade alcohol space. And this also means it's a wonderful time to be a customer in India right now, especially if you appreciate highly crafted and customized alcoholic beverages that are not mass produced, but appeal to a very specific taste profile. My guest today is one such entrepreneur. So that said, is the founder of Trillium Beverages, which is also the maker of the popular Thirsty Fox Cider, which is an award-winning all-natural craft cider made in small batches using single-origin American apples. Sid comes across as an unusual entrepreneur, especially in this category, because he doesn't really come from a family that had anything to do with the alcohol business, and he confesses that he and his team didn't really know much about making ciders until they actually started the business. They are, however, obsessed with quality and getting a particular taste profile exactly right. So much so that they import most of their raw materials, from apples to honey to even the algae that goes into the filtering process. I want to speak to Sid about this very unique journey and uh, mostly about this vibrant Indian market for cider that is waiting to be unlocked. This is the Filter Coffee Podcast and we'll be right back after this very short break. Stay with us. Welcome to the Filter Coffee Podcast, Siddharth. How are you doing? Good, good, Karthik. How are you? As good as things can be. I, I live in Delhi, so it's not uh, the greatest of times. It hasn't been for the last eight weeks or so. I think we are recording on the 27th of May, but I think things are improving. You are speaking to us, of course, from Manhattan. How are things there? Things are actually um, very, very different. So um, my wife, Nupur, and I came um, to New York in September of last year. And, you know, we could walk down um, Times Square and you would not see a single um, single soul out in the streets. Um, I don't think you can even imagine um, how deserted uh, New York and uh, Manhattan was at that point. But um, luckily, I think what has happened with uh, the vaccinations kind of being out in um, full swing, everything is now open. Um, so... Just on Tuesday, I went in to a bar, I think after um, almost a year and had my first couple of drinks in a, in a bar in over a year and a half. And so it's, um, it's, it's actually great. The weather is uh, really nice with temperatures in the 30s, uh, you know, it feels just like spring. Um, and we're slowly but steadily kind of seeing signs of the city kind of coming back to life. And, um, you know, I wouldn't want to be anywhere else um, when, when that, um, you know, when, when New York is kind of slowly kind of seeing signs of life um, because um, um, it's, it's actually kind of nice to be able to go out and eat and drink and, you know, kind of be out and about um, after at least like a, a year of being um, locked down now. Going to a bar and having a drink at this point sounds like science fiction to me, but uh, hopefully I think it will get normalized. <laughs> yeah, hopefully. Days. I mean, uh, hopefully things kind of improve. Um, and we are actually just waiting um, for um, the COVID situation in India to improve because um, um, right. we're just waiting to kind of, we're itching to kind of come back uh, because um, New York is, uh, is uh, you know, a, it's, it's still home for us, but um, it's uh, India um, is, is where we 
kind of belong and you know our business is there and you know talking of which uh, you presently i'm assuming you you spend time between bombay and in new york and uh, in a way uh, your your the last decade or so of your life has been that way isn't it talk, talk to us a little bit about growing up uh, and then your your early career before you became an entrepreneur so i grew up in a small town a relatively small town in gujarat i i grew up in baroda uh, went to uh, went to a public school uh, uh pretty much uneventful um childhood growing up um i moved to the um the us um right after my 12th grade i went to purdue got my um, undergrad in chemical engineering i think right around the early 2000s um, i'm sure um there was this uh, huge uh, uh, influx of indian students wanting to go to the the us and uh, that was the the cool thing back then i happened to come from a business family background so my dad was a chemical engineer and one of the things that he always told me uh, which i i still kind of remember and it's something that i've uh, tried to live by is he said that try and focus on you know either uh, getting a good um, engineering degree or a good uh, good science degree uh, because that is something that will help you not necessarily kind of land a job but it will help you kind of really think about um how to solve problems and i think um you know having an engineering mindset and kind of looking at life from a from an engineering perspective and kind of being able to think in systems kind of think about um you know uh, cause and effect and kind of applying uh, a structured way of thinking to um to life um has um actually kind of um, really really made a, a large impact on on how i think what did he do what was his line of work so my father um my father joined my uncle in the early 80s uh, to set up a uh, plastics manufacturing business in uh, in in baroda and so what they were doing was they basically made uh, colors for plastics and so to kind of give you an example so um, every time you kind of saw a uh, see the, the red color in a coca cola cap more likely than not uh, it came from us so the wow. way that process works is you start with virgin plastic which is you know uh, pellets of uh, polypropylene or um, you know some other type of virgin plastic you add these color concentrates and you get like you know depending on the application you either get like black or blue blue or green uh, and then there are other aspects um, of that also so you can have uh, functional plastics so you know uh, areas where you need um, high temperature say the the casing of a cooker or the dashboard of a car we we made um, you know the plastics that kind of go into that so after becoming an engineer um, i um, you know like all international students you know on their opts and their um, you know student visas i had to kind of try and find um, a job that would sponsor my h1b and so i tried kind of looking around um, the first job that i got was with um, l'oreal in new jersey in their lab i spent a good 6 months with them um, so i worked on their um, shampoos i worked on their bronzers i worked on their lipsticks um kind of um, helping the um, the lab guys kind of um, create uh, batches and testing i moved back to india in um july of 20 uh, 2007 uh, and then um decided to kind of work with my parents for uh, three years before kind of realizing that you know selling plastics was was rather kind of mundane and something that i was really not interested in doing for the rest of my life because you don't get to interact with consumers you don't necessarily in most instances get to see the reaction of how somebody kind of interacts with your products um or the the effect it has on them um so 2010 decided to get my mba came to seattle you know got my mba from the university of washington graduated in 2012 and um at that point in time um you know Amazon was um known to be one of the most difficult places to kind of um get into more from a job perspective at that point in time they were considered even more difficult to get into than say um MIT or Harvard um and so i yeah i ended up getting um uh, um a role with um their corporate finance team in their Amazon web services division um, so i was there for uh, close to a year and a half um so that kind of put us around 2014 um and at that point in time my parents uh, decided to sell the business um in india to um a swiss um chemical company uh, by the name of clarion 
Um, and Clarient had a manufacturing plant in you know, uh, Western Massachusetts. So I decided to kind of move to Clarion to kind of help um, them with their um, strategy and, and marketing operations um, uh, for their plastics division. Um, so it was it was around that time that I kind of got, um, you know, I bumped into uh, uh, Bantam Cider because they, I used to go to this gym that shared a wall with Bantam Cider. Uh, and so every evening, I, you know, on the way back from, uh, from the gym, I'd stop by their tap room and, and pick up, um, you know, a couple of ciders to kind of drink at home. And, you know, one of those uh, Saturday, um, early Saturday morning classes, um, I was kind of working out. I remember this, this distinctly. Um, and I was like, maybe this is, there is, you know, you know a larger um, idea and a larger market for this um, type of products in, in India because we have a, a sizable, you know, alcoholic beverage market. Our food is um, rather spicy, um, and you need something kind of, um, you know, to balance that that heat and spice. Um, and generally, Indians prefer stuff that's uh, relatively sweeter. So I was like, okay, let me try and see if I can I can speak to the owners, uh, Dana and Michelle, who run Bantam. So I left a, I left a note um, with the lady who was manning the taps there um, that that afternoon. I said that you know. I'm, I'm looking to kind of speak with the owners to try and see if there is uh, an interest to kind of collaborate. But uh, at this point, uh, so that, uh, you, you're working in, in, in Amazon. Um, um, you, you largely spend time in a very different world, isn't it? Yeah. At this point, how much did you know about the alcohol industry, the beverage market in India? Were you, were you at this point doing some sort of a research in understanding that? So I don't think I really started doing any sort of research until like early part of 2016 because, you know, I, I didn't really know where this idea was going. Um, so I think like late 2015, like one of those Decembers, um, um, I was I was home and kind of trying to talk to my dad about this uh, potential idea. And he was the one who convinced me um, to a large extent to kind of uh, pursue this uh, because he tasted the products and, and all of that. Um, and so... Um, there was, um, you know, sometimes they say ignorance is bliss. And I think um, this was one of those instances where um, I think it's, uh, it's, it's rather true. Uh, and, and there was, I mean, there are two aspects of this, right? Like um, the ignorance is what lets us kind of challenge the preconceived notions uh, about how things should be done. Um, but the ignorance also kind of does um, hinder um, a lot of our efforts um, in terms of how we reach our consumers and who we target. And talk about that um, in a little bit more detail. So I had absolutely no um, kind of uh, idea about the challenges or the, the potential of the market. I just knew that um, you know um, there was um, the idea was was good. Uh, the products were were good. Um, and one of the things that my father always taught me, um, you know, he had a keen focus on on, on quality. Um, and he always said that, you know, regardless of whatever you do, um, you know, do a few things, but do them really, really well. Um, and I think that is something that we've taken to heart with our products. Um, and, it, you know, the, the, the testament is in the fact that we've already won three rounds of awards um, with, our, with our ciders um, on an international level. So we've always focused on the quality. Uh, we've we launched with with two products, um, and it took us uh, close to a year and a half to perfect the recipes, to make sure that we sourced the right ingredients, we found the right partners to work with. But at this point, I just want to quickly digress into cider itself, right? Like, uh, correct me if I'm wrong. I'm probably coming from a place of ignorance, but cider always has been internationally, I guess, India for sure always been the underdog among alcohol beverages, right? Like, it, uh, it makes perfect sense. It's probably healthier than most of the other options out there. But it's never been in your top one or two options, isn't it? You're always thinking, like, if it's very hot, I need a beer. And yeah. if you're in India, it's winter, you're thinking, I need, I need old mog. Why cider? And, and what is, uh, how do you make of cider's role in the larger beverage menu? So... I come from the school of thought that, you know, our perception of the world is limited by the experiences that we have, right? Like we, um, as humans, kind of fail to imagine things that we've not been exposed to or we've not interacted with, right? Um, while our uh, imagination um, 
he is our, our greatest strength as a, as a species, we kind of struggle to kind of conceive of the, the possibilities of what can be possible, right? Um, and to kind of the reason that I'm kind of bringing this up is up until a couple of years, nobody knew what a wheat beer um, would taste like in India, right? Unless you travel to Europe or the US, um, you know, but you get uh, players now kind of, you know, it, it needs one person to kind of start um, something for the rest of the, the folks to follow. The answer to why ciders is primarily because we kind of believe that, you know, they fill um, a very good gap on the continuum between wines on one hand and beers on the other. Um, and let me kind of take a, a couple of minutes to kind of explain uh, what I mean by that. So to kind of explain this um, a little bit uh, better, right? So the, the way that ciders are made is very, very similar to how wines are made. Um, it's basically you take um, apple juice, add some yeast, um, and that um, yeast kind of converts the, the sugar in the apple juice into um, carbon dioxide and, um, and ethanol. Uh, very similar to wine. The only difference here now is that instead of grape juice, you're using um, apple juice, right? That's where the similarities kind of stop, right, um, with, with wine. The reason that they're close, the, that we kind of compare them to beers is uh, primarily on the occasion of consumption, right? Like beers are, are more of like, you know, it's, it's hot outside, it's a, it's a fizzy drink, it's a single serve bottle. Um, and it's uh, relatively low in alcohol. So beers kind of tend to be around the, the four and a half to um, 6% um, ABV. Wines tend to generally be around the 12 to 15% uh, um, uh, ABV range. Um, and so the ciders kind of borrow, like we feel the, the best characteristics of, you know, both those um, sets of um, uh, categories of products. And I think the reason why ciders kind of stood out for us uh, primarily was one the beer market in india is is actually very very large right like it's mm. one of the the, the, the largest beer markets um, in the world and there is a, a huge potential for people to kind of you know consume stuff that's slightly you know um, sweeter slightly more uh, refreshing given the, the conditions of you know the, the climatic conditions and obviously um, we're starting to push now to um, help consumers kind of pair with uh, food. And so the um, ciders with their inherent kind of sweetness um, really kind of help uh, counteract the, the spice and the heat of our, our Indian food, yeah. right? And yeah. so they make a, a perfect um, pairing um, in, in that respect. So when you talk about the beer market in India, which many might not know, but is dominated entirely by strong beer, you're really talking about the masses that drink to get high, isn't it? Yeah. I assume that at Thirsty Fox's price range, you're probably talking to the cream of the market, which chooses alcohol on taste profile uh, and not really to, to get high. Yeah. But I do get what you mean by our preference as a market for sweetness in alcohol. In fact, I was recently studying the whiskey market and I was shocked to know that most of the large volume whiskeys sold in India are actually chemically speaking, not really whiskeys. And if you were to test it in a laboratory in Europe, it might actually get classified as rum or brandy because of the exceptionally high molasses content, isn't it? Um, so, yeah. Um, and I mean, the, the other thing is, uh, you know, um, it's relatively easy for us to convert people who are already consuming. Um, it's, it's relatively easy for us to target people who are already consuming beers um, or like, say, a rosé or a champagne because the characteristics of our ciders are... are, are are rather similar because we we use the same we use wine making principles to make our ciders rather than using beer making principles. So there is this uh, uh, smoothness and there is this uh, lightness to the to the products. Um, and so it's you know while we're still very very early in our journey, um, we find that people who tried our products want to kind of keep coming back for more and more, primarily because of um, you know how easily. Um, they go down. Um, and I remember this um, even from my uh, time uh, kind of trying the, the Bantam ciders, which is what um, actually our ciders are modeled on uh, with their help, is, um, you know, you can easily have two or three um, in a sitting and not really know how much you've consumed or not feel the the heaviness of the, the alcohol kind of hitting you, right? Like there is not that inherent bitterness um, that you would find with the, the beers or 
that um, heaviness or that complexity of uh, you know of wines. You don't have to finish like a whole 750 ml uh, bottle in one sitting. This is a, a rather kind of handy uh, 330 ml bottle um, that um, you know um, you can you can finish in in you know um, a relatively easy half an hour or so if you're pacing yourself. Um, so those are some of the things that you know we we felt that when we were um, doing our work and our research that. You know, ciders um, as a market are, you know, we're trying to go after consumers who would not necessarily uh, kind of have an option of of something that's more palatable. So, and and this is this is rather interesting that we found out is that women uh, obviously generally tend to prefer um, our ciders now um, as opposed to, you know, when they'd reach when they'd not have an op- when they'd consider either a, um, you know, a, a vodka, a cranberry, or a gin and tonic, or a champagne, or, um, now um, there is this option for them, which is relatively easier to consume, um, doesn't feel as um, alcoholic, and just generally just goes down easier. Right. So, so coming back to your, your entrepreneurial journey, you know, you're, um, you're now engaged with, with, with Bantam, you, you've done a bit of a study of the Indian market. Um, but I'm assuming there are more layers to this before you are able to actually start a company and a brand, isn't it? What are some of those those challenges like? So I think the biggest challenge um, for me personally uh, was, uh, I think, I didn't really understand or appreciate the the Indian way of doing things, right? Um, so I um, spent the the majority of my adult professional life um, having worked in um, in the US where you have you know systems and processes and you know a rather kind of organized way of doing things and moving from the US to India um, and expecting that level of um, you know thoroughness and organization and uh, and kind of systems and processes I think was very very frustrating uh, for me um, to begin with when we when we set out uh, to, to start the business you know so simple things like opening up a bank account um, you know transferring funds internationally um, to um, um, you know our consultants um, just it was it was challenging it was frustrating um, it was at times kind of um, it left me with me scratching my head like really questioning why we do things um, a certain way. So can I give you a funny example? I had to kind of make a, a foreign transfer uh, from a bank and they, they needed a signature on an invoice. Um, and I sent them an email with the actual invoice and said, you know, here is the invoice. Um, but they said, no, you need to take a printout of the email, sign it and send it back to us. Like I was, you know, that was like having come from the US, um, you know, that was unheard of like they completely boggled my mind um and i think after i kind of personally kind of accepted the fact that you know this is how um things um kind of um you know work in india this this, this is how things are set up and you know this is just um the, the law of the land i think i was kind of like you know i now don't bat an eyelid and i just you know, say, screw it, let's just get work done and, and move on. Um, so I think that was like the biggest, um, you know, uh, learning uh, for me was to kind of not necessarily try and spend or expend too much energy trying to kind of question things and kind of, you know, get on with it and, and kind of, um, you know, move things along. Um, right. And and that took a that took a significant amount of time for me to kind of be okay with. Can you elaborate on this a little bit more for our audience? What specific steps are involved in someone setting up a business like yours in India? So um, I'm going to talk about um, alcoholic beverages because that's uh, that's that's what I know of. Um, as far as um, you know, being able to market and, and sell alcoholic beverages, uh, depending on uh, the state you're in, um, this is this is rather important um, for, for people to understand. Is that India, um, every state is a country um, as far as alcohol regulations are concerned, right? So alcohol is a state subject um, and the taxes um, that get collected go to the state exchequer um, in, in all instances. 
So each state legislates and controls the, the laws for that state. So if you have to sell from, say, Maharashtra to Goa, you need to be compliant with uh, the rules in, in both states. So that's just the, the general kind of context. And I'm now going to talk only about Maharashtra. Uh, there are commonalities for, uh, for other states, like broad commonalities for, for other states, but um, you know, the specifics kind of apply to just to the state of Maharashtra. So in order for us to sell uh, alcohol, you obviously need to have uh, you know, a place to manufacture. Um, and um, you need um, facile licenses to be able to uh, market and promote um, your products. So we um, con currently contract manufacture uh, from a facility in, uh, in ASIC. Um, and so we are using that facility's uh, excise license. Um, as far as selling is concerned, we have our own uh, facile licenses um, that we've applied for um, that let us, um, you know, um, be in compliance with the, the food safety uh, regulations um, for uh, sale and uh, marketing of, of food products. Um, so, from from a regulation standpoint for uh, for India, those are the uh, for Maharashtra, those um, those are the two big things, and they are applicable um, overall um, across uh, across India as well. Um, beyond that, um, you know, you have um, other kind of compliances. Um, if you are importing um, the raw materials, which we do, um, you know, um, and then you know now you have these uh, ISO certifications. If you do choose to get uh, get into, um, you know, uh, that's more on the, the quality side. But in in a nutshell, if you are if you want to sell um, alcohol, you need uh, a facile license um, and you need um, an excise license to be able to sell. Right. Why Nashik? Uh, is is that more of the climatic decision? Is it a logistics decision? Um, the reason um, um, we chose to kind of um, do our contract manufacturing in Nasik is because this goes back to the point that I made earlier, which is we manufacture our ciders uh, from uh, um, a process that is more similar to winemaking. And so Nasik uh, obviously is, um, you know, is uh, the wine gap of, of Maharashtra and uh, in India as well. And so... Um, the, the talent for winemaking kind of resides there. The, the facilities for winemaking kind of reside there. Um, and so it's it's just that, that um, you know, uh, that's where we found um, a, a good um, a partner to kind of help us um, scale our business. That's amazing. You, you were talking about some of the other challenges before I interrupted. Sorry. Yeah. So um, as far as, um, you know, being able to sell um, um, is concerned, um, um, I'll kind of explain how... Um, uh, the market is set up. So Maharashtra is what is called a, a three-tier market, um, which where you have a manufacturer, so somebody like us, a distributor, and a retailer, right? Uh, so as a manufacturer, one cannot directly sell uh, to a, a retailer unless, and this is an exception, I think only in the state of Maharashtra, I could be wrong, unless you are selling wines. Um, and so our, um, our products get categorized as, as food wines, so we are lucky that if we wanted to, we could sell directly to a, a, a retail outlet. But generally, uh, more often than not, um, if you're doing spirits or if you're doing beers, if you're manufacturing alcoholic beverages, you sell into a distributor who, you know, will get, like, say, Kingfisher or Bira or, or Hogart kind of at a central location. And then from that distributor, the distributor will send out to your um, local mom and pop uh, wine shops and, and beer shops or um, kind of send to uh, a bar or a restaurant or a hotel. And that's how generally the, the system in India is, is set up, very similar to um, you know, um, how the U.S. also kind of does this. So that's the biggest challenge um, for us as an up-and-coming brand uh, because we cannot you know, facilitate a transaction with the end consumer. Like we have to go through this channel of um, you know, being able to sell, you know, selling to the distributor and um, selling to the retailer. Um, and, you know, I'll, I'll kind of segue into what we ended up doing when uh, the COVID lockdowns hit um, early last year. So, like I was saying, excise uh, policy is a, is a state subject. And so Maharashtra at that point in time decided to kind of, you know, shut down uh, the sale of alcohol because they considered it to be non-essential um, at that point in time. So um, March, they shut down all the liquor shops. 
around the last week of June that they they opened up, um, and I'm sure you've seen seen the videos of people lining up um, to kind of get their fix um, when they opened. I think that's when they realized that they the, the state um, excise realized that they needed to kind of have a better way. So that's when they facilitated, um, you know, online delivery. Uh, but even there, um, the way online deliveries work in Maharashtra is that we as a brand cannot sell directly to the consumer, right? Like because the underlying excise rules haven't really changed. So what that meant was we had to, you know, now there are two channels that um, alcohol companies can sell to. One is called the off-premise and the other is called the on-premise. The off-premise is your stores, your wine shops, your liquor stores, all of that. The on-premise um, it um, includes everything like your bars, your restaurants, your pubs, um, your, your um, uh, you know, permit rooms and all of that. So with, with COVID, we lost one complete channel that we had access to, uh, that we would have normally had access to before, uh, before the restrictions and before everything shut down. So the only channel that we had was um, we could sell through the, the beer shops and the wine shops. Uh, but now the challenge is the advertising rules in India um, say that you cannot uh, openly promote um, the sale or consumption of alcohol, right? Um, and this is actually, I think, um, um, I'll have to go back in and check, but um, it's, I think uh, this was originally uh, part of the Indian constitution that prohibited the, the consumption of, kind of, uh, you know, of alcohol. Through surrogate is this the only way you can, you can, you can advertise as well? Yeah. Yes. Um, and so surrogacy is the only only way that you can kind of advertise, right? But for a, a small startup um, brand like us, that kind of gets difficult because we're kind of spending now on marketing something that is not necessarily your primary uh, source of revenue. Anyways, so that's, that's what happened. Um, and so we had to quickly kind of pivot to, um, you know, um, um, getting our um, um, digital systems in place because now uh, people were stuck indoors with um, the the only thing that we could kind of market on uh, or kind of get in front of consumers was on their phones or on their um, tablets and computers, right? Um, and so we had to quickly kind of uh, put together a plan to start, um, you know, being able to drive volume and sales through um, the, the wine shops and, and liquor stores because the the bars and restaurants right. were were shut for um, an indeterminate amount of time, um, and the rules and regulations were were and are still kind of so great that um, they don't want brands kind of promoting their um, um, their brands uh, directly, but um, you know. They only let, uh, you know, you cannot have, like, for instance, you cannot have bottle shots on um, your um, Instagram pages. You cannot, like, have, yeah. show people consuming alcohol. None of that is, um, is allowed. And so the way that we kind of got around this, this problem was we started kind of, you know, investing in getting in front of consumers on their phones and on Instagram and on through, through digital, through social media. And we you know, set up um, a system where we got orders from consumers and then worked with their, the closest uh, wine shops and retailers to fulfill those orders because at that point in time, the, the Maharashtra state excise had said that home deliveries of alcohol were permitted. So what we started doing was we'd, you know, get orders um, online and then call up um, the closest wine shop and help them kind of sell the products. And, you know, that's been challenging because that's the most that we can do from a from a legal aspect and still be compliant with, uh, with right. the rules and regulations. So that's been a challenge because now as a, as a new product and as a, as a new category of um, alcoholic beverages, you know, unless somebody tries our product uh, or samples our product, it's rather difficult to kind of, you know, um, spend 300 rupees on a, on a pint of cider um, uh, without having tasted it, right? Like, unless you've tried it, you're going to be rather skeptical yeah. because yeah. Um, we are one of the most expensive um, Indian single serve products on the market, like at 300 bucks. And so, uh, I want to talk about that. And then for that, I, I wanted to go back to your, your entrepreneurial journey, which is, uh, you know, at this point, you're, you're setting it up uh, in India, you're going through all the, the regulations, the compliances, etc. 
um a are you doing this alone at this point do you have a founding team and and b you know have you found investors in the journey by now or are you doing this yourself so this has and uh, still is a uh, completely bootstrap business that i am kind of funding through the family um and so i was lucky enough to find um a couple of people um early on who are um, still with me um nikhil and sima um who um i had to <laughs> convince to kind of join me um you know um on on this journey why thirsty fox this is rather interesting um so the fox actually um as uh, uh folklore would have it is is known to uh pick out the best fruit um best apples uh from an orchard and so when we were kind of thinking about you know the names of the brand we um you know locked ourselves up in a big conference room over a couple of days and just um you know brainstormed on what kind of uh, a brand that we wanted and what we wanted it to resonate with and um you know the name thirsty fox kind of stuck out for us primarily as um uh, you know being able to connotate the simple fact that we go out and find the best raw materials the best um, best apples the best pepper the best honey that we can find um and kind of you know ferment and and create a product that you know is um emblematic of that that um that dedication that love that um you know that uh that effort that we put in um and hopefully um you know uh consumers kind of um Right. you know uh, see that come through and, and you you mentioned the uh, it's emblematic of the the quality of the the raw materials that go into it um you know i i'd interrupted you when you were talking about the, the price you say yeah. um it's also i'm assuming more expensive because uh, you you import your your apples don't you is yeah. is that the correct thing to say and that is, yeah. about that decision and uh, why did you think that was the best way to go about this So um like I said um so the way that we looked at this problem was we had a um uh, you know destination and a target uh, flavor profile that we wanted to get to which was um Bantams um you know um um so our Izzy is modeled on Bantams Wonderkind and our uh, Reed is modeled on uh, Bantams Rojo and so we had a target that we wanted to get to. um as far as flavor profile um and um uh, you know the sensorial characteristics of the the products were concerned and people still think that we are rather foolish to um import um the bulk of our raw materials um but this kind of goes back to the the point that i made earlier which is we really wanted to kind of put the best products out there uh, that we possibly could so while we settled on um you know uh, importing our products um we spent a tremendous amount of time trying to test and source uh, products from within india so we started off kind of fermenting um you know um apples from uh, from himachal uh, and from kashmir you know um found out that they didn't necessarily kind of lead to the profile that we wanted when we compared them to uh, the bantam products um kind of we also went to um sikkim and and nagaland and uh, the northeast to source um our, our, our honeys we went to kurg um to source our honeys um you know one of the honeys that we found was actually decent but the problem there was the manufacturer was rather small scale who would not necessarily be able to meet um uh, you know our uh, volume requirements so we were kind of stuck um and so while the intention was always um uh, you know to try and source locally and obviously you know if you source locally um the cost structure is um is so much more favorable because now when we when we import our raw materials um 70 to 75% of the cost um, of our raw materials is just paid in um excise duties and taxes right so so something that would kind of cost you um a uh, 100 bucks is now costing you closer to 175 or, or almost 200 rupees by the time it gets from the port to the the winery so we didn't take any of those decisions lightly um and they were done in, with a lot of thought and a lot of deliberation yeah so we wanted to put out the the best uh products uh possible 
to kind of give you um, another example about the lens that we go to. So you must have kind of heard about this uh, whole issue with um, contaminants in, in honey and the adulteration of honey that kind yes. of broke um, a couple of years, like um, I think late last year, right? And I had actually stumbled upon an interesting uh, Netflix documentary about um, how honey is one of the most adulterated uh, food ingredients in the world. Um, and my view on that was if we were to source honey from anywhere in the world, um, I had to make sure that the honey that we were putting in our product uh, met or exceeded the strictest standards of uh, purity in the world, right? Um, and so what we ended up doing was um, we conducted, um, we sent our, our honey samples that we um, got from, uh, from the US um, um, and we sent them all the way to Germany to get them uh, chemically fingerprinted. And that test in itself um, cost us close to a lakh. But I knew that at the end of the day that the honey that I was putting into Izzy was free of um, antibiotics because um, bees get um, fed a lot of antibiotics uh, to kind of keep them healthy and stuff, that they were free from um, heavy metal, obviously with depending on the types of uh, flowers bees, bees feed. There is um, heavy metal contamination. There is issues with um, antibiotics um, and then mostly what happens as far as adulteration is concerned is um, honey gets uh, diluted or cut with uh, either rice syrup or wheat syrup or some uh, some other uh, sort of um, sugar right and so we just wanted to make sure that you know the honey that we were using was in fact really 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 good honey that was pure um, according to uh, the European standards. So Europe has um, stricter food safety guidelines, even more so than the US. To give you another example, like on the manufacturing side, you know, people kind of tend to use what are called uh, DE filters, uh, basically stands for diatomaceous earth, which is basically a sort of algae uh, that you use to kind of filter your, either your beer or your wines or your uh, meads or your ciders. What we found out during our, um, our, our process and our, our research that DE filters, um, because they are, you know, so fine in nature, uh, they are very, very microscopic. They are a known carcinogen, basically, that means that they can cause cancer. So the European Commission uh, kind of classifies DE uh, diatomaceous earth as a, as a carcinogen, uh, not so as much here in the U.S., and so we made a conscious decision of not using um, any DE filters in our process. And so we use, uh, you know, uh, membrane-based filters that are made out of uh, plastics and uh, other kind of uh, filter media that we've uh, installed. So those are the levels that we go through to make sure that, you know, I am confident that the rest of the team is confident that the product that we are putting out are not only safe, uh, uh, but kind of meet the, the most strictest standards um, possible uh, for human consumption. Kind of going back to the point that you were talking about on the pricing bit, um, I think the reason that we, you know, price the product at 300 is um, we think that as an Indian brand and as an Indian company, we are capable of creating products that can compete on a world stage, that we can compete with uh, the whole gardens and Coronas and, and Stellas of the world. Only if we kind of set our sights and our um, targets to kind of not necessarily kind of cut corners or kind of try and make a big buck, but actually be true to the craft of making something, kind of dedicating the time and effort of understanding the principles, kind of challenging some of the preconceived notions of why things are done a certain way. I think there is tremendous talent in this country. Uh, there is tremendous potential, you know, it's just a matter of being able to take it easy, take it slow, be confident and, and believe in the work and the effort that you're putting in. And I think you're kind of seeing this in play out. I'm talking obviously about the, the Alcobel space now. You are yeah. seeing how some of these um, other Indian brands across other categories are, you know, kind of holding their own on a world stage, right? Like um, some of the gins, some of the meads, um, um, us as ciders, um, even the whiskeys. We are now um, being recognized um, uh, internationally and, and, and globally as uh, being able to make really, really good quality products. And I think 
when we are true to that that actual craft and that actual kind of passion uh, of creating stuff that we as consumers kind of enjoy drinking that we enjoy kind of sharing with with each other uh, you know so that is the, the you know if we put ourselves in that shoe in those shoes you know it kind of helps you take the right decisions um, right. which you know force you to kind of really think about what you want to do you know i actually want to talk to you a little bit about that um it's got a lot of time when i was living um in the us in a city called san antonio which is in texas and it has a, such a uh, uh such a huge culture a lot of history of mm-hmm. home brewing right like uh, some of the best beer brewing festivals in the country are, are in, in san antonio and i've seen that you know you you sort of went if you go to a, a bar a mom and pop sort of a bar a local bar you'll find like uh, uh, an array of choices right uh, most of them are local most of them are are crafted uh, mm-hmm. with a very particular theme in mind etc yeah um in india of course you know we we've not gone through uh, that phase yet I and mean, we've always yeah. been up until a few years back a very mass produced uh, sort of uh, uh, sort of alcohol right um how do you feel about the indian market in the next 5 6 years um do you feel like we're going to see probably an influx of many many different brands whether it is beer wine which are locally made which are crafted this way so i think um what's going to happen um and obviously um you know um this is all with the with the disclaimer that i'm trying to forecast and um and, and kind of predict the future and i don't know how things are going to pan out i can only hope that they do um and so um just that um, kind of disclaimer and context there you know what we are seeing now with um just the activity surrounding the alcohol space is um you're getting a lot of um uh, smaller brands like ours um kind of um, popping up kind of um, jumping on the on the train and the bandwagon of um trying to create uh, a differentiated product whether it's in in wines or it's in um, the gin and the the liquors the spirit space uh, or even if it's like beers um, to a large extent now uh, beers uh, ciders and meads um, and um, uh, rtds and spitzers which is like the big thing now um is um is that you're going to see um a lot of small um kind of um uh, players kind of come in um trying to kind of uh, create um, some sort of uh, niche for themselves the challenge that i um think that we're going to face is is smaller brands um and uh, you know um uh, as, as startups is while the the potential for the market is is very very huge um you know we have to kind of you know take into consideration that there are a lot of large players in the market who can you know um, if they wanted to kind of um, out compete us on on price um, and out compete us on just uh, their scale and um, you know uh, width and depth of distribution um what's going to kind of happen is um, eventually i think some of these um, brands are going to get um, you know, either acquired or uh, folded into um, existing um, you know larger brands but um we are going to start seeing a lot of activity um in the space primarily because as a country and as a people um you know we are getting exposed to you know uh, people are traveling people are getting exposed on social media people are um are consuming uh, new and different types of beverages um there are people are having different kinds of experiences both within the country and and when they travel um and i think people are always going to look for something new and interesting right like who wouldn't want to try um something something different um i think what's going to happen eventually is that you're going to start seeing um a lot of smaller companies like ours kind of pop up across the country but i think the difference uh, compared to um the us i think is going to be that rather than having um you know localized um you know geographically specific um brands you are going to get brands that are that begin in one place but then kind of expand into um the other states um and kind of you know maybe like us for example we'd always call like mumbai home and and maharashtra home 
but then um, our plans are to kind of be available um, across the country. Like we're not going to uh, necessarily, we don't yet have plans on, you know, creating CIDR specific for Karnataka or CIDR specific for Maharashtra or CIDR specific for Delhi or CIDR specific for Goa uh, just yet. Um, and I think what you're going to get is as the market kind of matures and develops, you're going to get these smaller brands that are hopefully, I, I hope, um, you know, morph into larger, you know, um, uh, national um, kind of brands that, um, you know, have distribution and, and reach and availability in um, all states of course. I, I think that's the way it's, it's going to pan out uh, because as a country, I think we're still, you know, at least 15, 20 years behind um, the West and I think even behind China as far as that drinking culture is considered. Uh, we're still um, quite a few years behind having that sort of level of consumption to sustain a business that is focused say in Mumbai or in Pune or um, you know just in, in Maharashtra. So uh, businesses are yeah. I think going to be forced uh, to, to scale to kind of keep the, the lights kind of running um, and Think that's uh, that's what's going to happen uh, at least that's my perception of how right. i think uh, things are going to pan out so a uh, personal question and i'm going to start this with uh, an extremely bad joke you know given given your obsession with quality i think it is safe to say and i'm sure probably someone has said this to you that you're actually the apple among ciders isn't it and most certainly not the not the android yeah uh but said you don't come from an alcohol family, neither did you really know much about this business until you really started. So in this journey, were there moments of doubt when you actually thought you might not really make it? Yeah. <laughs> I think um, there have been moments in this journey where uh, this might sound rather kind of uh, shocking, but... Uh, there have been moments where I've come home from a, a long days of work and just broken down in front of my wife because I didn't know how we were going to be able to pull through because we didn't have the licenses. We had, um, you know, we had salaries to pay. We had um, rents to pay. We had um, uh, this at least like a, a crore worth of, um, you know, machinery that we had purchased. Um, we had, um, you know, uh, equivalent amounts in raw material that was tied up and sitting in a cold storage in close to Bombay and near the port. Um, there were there are still moments of doubt. Um, there are still moments of doubt in terms of how we're going to scale the business, where are we going to get the funding from, uh, what is our strategy going to be. Um, you know, one of the things that I have learned is I think nothing kind of trains you for the mental and emotional roller coaster of setting up a business other than just having to do it you know when you don't have a paycheck coming in where you know you're living off your um, your savings you know you feel a, a strong sense of responsibility towards your teammates and people who have put faith in you and kind of left corporate jobs coming from you know, multinational companies, um, listed companies who put all this confidence in you, left those jobs, come uh, come join you. You have that sense of responsibility um, towards them. And, um, you know, you have to make sure that you pay the salaries on time, you know, you, um, treat your, uh, you know, your agencies and your partners with respect. There are moments of doubt that we really don't know how it is that we are going to, uh, you know, uh, get through. But, um, and, you know, they teach you strategy, they teach you marketing, they teach you finance and accounting in, in MBA schools. Um, I think the part that kind of does get left out is how do you kind of deal with people in a fair and equitable manner? How do you treat people with respect? Um, and I think nothing kind of prepares you for the emotional and mental roller coaster of starting a journey. The only thing that does is that you know, you need to kind of be able to believe in yourself, in your idea, and to a large extent in the team that you put together that, you know, you guys can, you know, you, you are able to kind of figure this out because when we started, none of us knew anything about cider making. Uh, we just, um, we got, uh, you know, our cider maker who comes from, from Sula um, and he learned um, on the job um, and he's gone out and created uh, internationally award-winning ciders. and so. 
it's that faith and that uh, confidence in your ability to be able to uh, really, you know, ask very, very fundamental, simple questions, like to be able to work from first principles, kind of really ask as to why are things being done a certain way? Is there a better way of doing this? Is there a faster way of doing this? Is there a cheaper way of doing this? That kind of gets you um, through that rut. And I think having that ability to really trust in um, in yourself is what kind of keeps us um, keeps us going. And I think, um, you know, if, if somebody were to ask me, uh, you know, what's what's one piece of advice, um, I would say that if you if you think that you know you have a, a a good product that is validated by the market that your consumers are enjoying, you should just keep the consumer in mind. Don't worry about what the competition is doing. Don't worry about um, you know what the other companies are doing. Just make sure that you focus on the consumer, focus on the product and the brand, and invest all of the energy to make sure that the product gets into the hands of the right consumer at the right time at the right place. Um, and I think. Um, that um, is is what kind of um, keeps us going. Uh, I mean, we still have still have lots of doubts. We're still scrambling to kind of um, you know make sure that we have plans. We are now in the process of setting up three to five year plans. Who knows how long COVID is going to last? Who knows how uh, in what condition the the on trade um, opens up? Uh, you know, I, I kind of uh, feel for them. Um, you know, a lot of restaurants and bars have completely um, shut down for good. Um, yeah. So life is unpredictable. Um, you just have to do the best with the information that you have, and um, I mean, that's that's all you can do. But right. having having that faith and you know that confidence in your ability to problem solve, to figure things out is um, is important. And just taking one day at a time, but still kind of having that larger kind of uh, goal and vision in front of you. Is, is, is important, kind of. And really I would assume that as, 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 as the vision is mostly yours, right? I think we, in that sense, I'm assuming this must have also been a, a, bit, of a, a bit of a lonely journey, isn't it? While you have a team, etc. They're all believing in, in your vision. Um, so I want to go to the other end of, of that spectrum as well. And then uh, also ask you about, uh, while you're doing all of this, will you have the best of uh, cider makers and then the best ingredients, etc.? Uh, there must have been that one incident which must have reinforced your belief, like that moment of truth where you really knew that, okay, this is going to work. Right? Uh, do you have a moment like that? I think um, that moment kind of um, happened when we did the, uh, when we actually kind of flew in a, a pallet load of Bantam products, um, like I think, um, December of 2017, um, when we flew in a, a, a pallet load of uh, Bantam Fighter products um, and tested them with, with consumers and just um, got feedback um, from them. So we did a, a consumer uh, panel um, in, uh, in Mumbai and the responses that we got were like incredible. They were like, um, you know, when can we buy this? Where can we buy this? And, you know, uh, that was a, a, a relatively inexpensive way um, for us to, you know, that was like a go no go decision in terms of do we really want to invest um, in in setting up this business um, or not. Um, and so when we kind of saw that unbiased, unfiltered, uh, you know, feedback from uh, from consumers, it just validated the idea, right? And I think over the course of the last year and year and a half, uh, you know, um, so one of the things that we've done is we collect feedback from uh, consumers who buy our products uh, uh, you know um, online we ask them to fill out a, a rather simple two question uh, survey which is you know uh, would you recommend uh, this product to your friend or family the average um, tends to be uh, either a 8 or a, or a 9 out of 10 and we give people um, you know uh, a space to kind of uh, comment and, and write their thoughts most instances, people just come back and say they, they love the taste and they love the packaging and they, they love the experience of, um, you know, of, of consuming our products. And, and, and every, every positive kind of, um, you know, interaction like that uh, gets kind of, you know, yeah, it's, it's there. So we use Slack and, you know, it gets piped into Slack and it's there for the, the whole team to see, right? That's what's kind of building confidence for, uh, for us and for the team. Um, and what's also helped, obviously, is uh, we've been, because 
um, you know, we've, we are so confident about the products. We've entered into so many competitions now on a, on an international um, level. Every competition we've entered, um, we've won a medal. Uh, so now we wow. have uh, three medals. And then just early this week, we, we found out that we won a fourth one. Unfortunately, I cannot talk about that just yet because that's, uh, that's still under embargo. So that we, we usually end the episode on a, on a slightly different note, uh, which is uh, talking to our guests about what he or she is watching, listening, reading, etc. Just, just so we get to understand the people behind the, the movement as well. Uh, how do you de-stress? Like, what do you, what do you watch? What are you watching these days? Or um, what are you listening to these days? So I'm not a not a big uh, TV fan. Um, I uh, I tend to spend um, uh, my time kind of reading on my iPad uh, or um, on on the phone. Um, my wife and I actually just kind of started. Um, funnily, uh, we kind of um, ran out of. Um, so the last series that I watched was was Homeland, um, um, which is excellent. Uh, so if people have not seen it, it's really really interesting. Um, and so that we kind of. You know, we had this routine where we watched uh, without fail uh, one episode every night, but that kind of got done early, um, early in January. Um, and so after that, we've not we've not really had anything uh, specific to kind of watch. Um, and then on and off, like I've been watching Shit's Creek. Uh, my wife has been forcing me to watch Shit's Creek. <laughs> I kind of find that um, rather hilarious, uh, but nothing, nothing kind of um, nothing that's um, kind of structured as far as watching is concerned. And then just a couple of days ago, we started watching um, uh, this uh, HBO original called The Flight Attendant, uh, which is um, it's kind of gripping, uh, kind of interesting. Uh, before that, we watched um, The Undoing on H HBO. Um, that was also kind of interesting. Uh, it's a murder mystery, a mini series and murder mystery. So um, as far as watching is concerned, watching is rather restricted, um, you know, uh, maybe once or twice, uh, twice a week. Now I spend uh, the majority of my time uh, reading. What are you reading these days? Um, so I'm um, actually kind of enjoying this book. Um, I, I have it right here with me. Um, it's called uh, Working Backwards by uh, Colin Breyer and, and Bill Carr. Um, so they talk about um, Amazon and how Amazon functions from you know, from an insider's perspective, you know, as somebody having worked with, um, worked with Amazon, uh, there are a lot of things that I, I recall and I kind of understand now how they um, kind of do things and, and why they do them. Um, and um, the other book that I've been reading right now is um, a very interesting book, um, actually, uh, that I would highly recommend uh, is uh, The Psychology of Money. Uh, it's written by Morgan Housel, um, who uh, used to work at Slate, uh, but now kind of works at uh, the Collaborative Fund uh, in, in New York, um, basically talking about, uh, you know, why we make um, some of the decisions that we do about money and how to kind of think about wealth and uh, greed and happiness. Uh, it's one of the better books that I have read in, in, in a long time. And as far as, uh, you know, as far as listening is concerned, um, so we just had a a daughter who's uh, five weeks old now. Um, so a lot of her time kind of goes spent, kind of um, um, you know, listening to uh, you know Wheels on the Bus and um, you know Old MacDonald. <laughs> um, and um, you know, uh, I'm assuming she's also the reason why you stopped watching an episode a night. Yeah. So it's, um, that's what happens when you have a have a newborn. Um, but yeah, That's if I'm out and about, um, or kind of we uh, will listen to podcasts and stuff, uh, primarily on business and economics. You know, a little yeah, bit a few favorites that. that you want to recommend to the audience. Um, I really enjoy, um, as far as um, um, health and fitness is concerned, um, I really enjoy uh, uh, Peter Atiyah's podcast. So. Um, um, that's really great if you really want to get into the, uh, you know, the, the biochemistry and the, the chemistry and the the research on, um, you know, how to lead um, um, a healthy life. He talks about, um, you know, fasting and, you know, uh, metabolic conditions. And so um, as Indians, we tend to tend to kind of be prone to diabetes and all of those uh, metabolic syndromes. So it's <laughs> of interest to me to kind of how to maximize and improve my health there. Um, on the, the business side, um, I enjoy the, the McKinsey podcasts. Uh, those are great um, um, because they tend to be 
rather actionable. Um, invest like the best with uh, Patrick O'Shaughnessy. He has some great guests, um, very similar to the ones that we're doing right now, uh, where he just talks to uh, uh, you know business leaders and entrepreneurs about their journey. Um, and then Masters in Business with uh, Barry Ritholtz, um, a little bit more on the, the finance uh, finance side, but um, the, he also has great guests. And then I'm sure your uh, listeners know about uh, uh, Shane Parrish's The Knowledge Project. Um, so that is also very, very um, um, interesting uh, kind of um, listen to. And then finally, as a nerd, I listen to uh, Mac Power users and um, the automators and uh, Focus. So um, those are a couple ones that I um, you know, definitely recommend that people check out if they're interested in you know, um, apps and technology and the, the Mac, the Apple ecosystem. Those are, those are great. And just general productivity in, for example, a great, great podcast on how to work smarter, how to kind of set up your systems, all of that. Uh, just great stuff that you know, uh, people are doing uh, stuff that I enjoy. Often underrated stuff, isn't it? Can can save you so much time. Yeah. Wonderful. So that thank you so much. It was an absolutely exhilarating conversation and wishing you and Thirsty Fox uh, all the yeah. success. Thank you so much. Um, it's It's been great chatting uh, and hopefully uh, we'll be in uh, in Delhi soon. Um, and uh, I hope you get to try the, the, the ciders uh, relatively soon. I can't wait. Like, now that I know your story, I'm, I'm, I'm like dying too. I'm glad. Thank you. If you like this podcast, don't forget to check out other interesting podcasts on the IBM network. You can listen to us on the IBM podcast app or ibmpodcasts.com. You can also follow us on our social media. We are at IBM podcasts on Twitter and Instagram. And if you want to reach out to me, I am the underscore Karthik. That's Karthik with an H on Twitter and filter underscore coffee. That's coffee with a K on Instagram. I hope you enjoyed that show. If you aren't following us on social media, please do. We're IVM Podcasts on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. We'd like to thank the sponsors on the network this week, Siet and Cred. We really appreciate the support. It is what makes this possible. So it was a fun week on Cider Says. We had guests like Dolly Singh. We had Kunit Monga. We had Kamya Jani of Curry Tales. And Cock and Bull, as we always did. Do check it out. I think you'll really, really enjoy that. On Pesa Vesa, we crossed 300 episodes and Anupam was joined by Akhil Handa, the digital head of Bank of Baroda. All Things Policy discussed topics like the 100 years of China's Communist Party, the Facebook versus the Government of India case, and the evolution of Indian science. On The Wire Talk, Siddharth Bhatia was joined by Gautam Bhatia to discuss the Central Vista project and why it's attracting so much flack. Sadaf and Archit are back on the non curry podcast and this time they raise the temperatures as they discuss the beloved Spice Mirchi. On the Millennial Athlete, this week Tanvi and Shlok speak to Sarita Chauri, a visually impaired judoist. And finally, I want to ask you all to give a listen to the Triangle Offense. Anybody who has heard me talk on a podcast knows I can't shut up about basketball and these guys know more about it than I do. So if you enjoy basketball, do check this out. Nishant and Monish do an excellent job with this show. I was one of their guests a few months ago, which is how I met them and tried to convince them to come onto the network. And they're finally here. So definitely do check this out. Show's available on all major podcasting platforms, but they also have a daily YouTube episode, which is available on the IVM Podcast channel. And with that, I hope to see you again next week. If you love cricket, listen up. The Edges and Sledges Cricket Podcast is here for you. Hosted by DJ, Varun, and me, Ashwin, we bring a fun, fresh fan's point of view to talking all things cricket. Sometimes it's just the three of us, sometimes we have guests, including current and former international cricketers. For new episodes every week, check out the Edges and Sledges Cricket Podcast on the IVM app, website, or wherever you get your podcasts.